C-O-I-N, C-Suite Offering Investors and Network. It takes you literally five minutes to check through a project and find out if it's legit. If it gets one red cross, then don't do it. But if it's got four green ticks, then go for it. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hello there and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. This is the show that gets you in front of your best audience and keeps you there. Now today I have the wonderful Jeremy Britton on the line with me. How are you, Jeremy? I'm doing exceptionally well, mate. Right? Love the long weekend. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They always go uh, by a bit too quickly. So, but on today's show, you and I, we're going to be uh, talking about your work as a best-selling author. You're an op uh, obviously an entrepreneur and a cryptocurrency uh, specialist. And we're going to be talking about how you accidentally created the world's first diversified crypto mutual fund with your business, Boston Trading. But before we do any of that, uh, Jeremy, I'd love to learn a little bit about you. Now, we were we started off our conversation talking about the potential for dogs to interrupt us throughout the calls. <laughs> and, uh, you know, given the fact that Boston Trading uses a, a dog uh, for their logo, let's start there. Do you have any pets? I do have two little Boston Terriers, mate. There you go. I'm not surprised about that. I've actually, <laughs> <laughs> I've actually seen some images of them. They must bring you a great deal of joy. Uh, yes, a great deal of joy, um, particularly during quarantine when there was, you know, no excuse for leaving the house unless you had a puppy. So you had to, yeah. you know, walk, walk the dog around the, around the block once a day. It was like the highlight of quarantine. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, now, tell us where you're calling in from today. I'm in Brisbane. Right. Now, I know they're getting pretty well smashed with weather, as is uh, New South Wales. How are you going for weather in your specific location? Yeah, we're doing all right here at the moment. We've had a lot of rain and the, and the lawn is looking very long. Um, mm -hmm. I've got the tomatoes and the passion fruit in the backyard are just going bananas. I bet. The, the worst weather we had was in January. Yep. Uh, we had flooding in, in Brisbane in January mm. and our house was okay because it's on the top of the hill, but down the bottom of the hill, about 100 metres away, is a whole bunch of cafes and restaurants and, and pubs and this sort of stuff. Mm. And down the bottom of the hill was underwater and all their power for all of those businesses is actually underground. Oh. So the council had to cut off the power to our entire suburb until they could drain oh. down there. So I'm, I'm working from home and for seven days I had no power Nothing. No, no electricity, no air conditioning, no internet. <laughs> it was very difficult to get things done, mate. Right? <laughs> so are you on the Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast? Whereabouts are you? Uh, well, top? Brisbane. I, I used to live Central in the Sunshine Brisbane. Coast. I moved down to Brisbane. Uh, oh, I right. did a stint in Bali for a couple of years, worked from there as well. So Yeah, no, I was going to ask you about that. Tell us about that. I've been to Bali a handful of times. I love it there. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd visited Bali or every year or or so I'd go over to Bali, uh, it's religious, when, my, isn't it? when my kids were when my kids were young, um, I'd, I'd save up all year by not spending any money, and then <laughs> go to Bali once a year, and I could get a leather jacket made for fifty dollars. I yes. could get three suits made for a hundred bucks. So it would be, it'd be my my like sort of changing my clothes every year and taking the kids over there. It's just a wonderful place to visit, and um, I got a few friends who lived over there and. Back in 2015, one of my friends said, oh, you've got to come over here and, and stay a lot, a lot longer. And I said, it's fine for a holiday, but, you know, the internet speeds aren't as good. And, mm. you know, that sort of stuff. It's different living there to, um, to actually visiting because uh, I, I could go without internet for a week, but not for a month. You know? No, and, I'm um, with you there. In, in 2015, my friend said, look, they've put fiber optics right across the island. Oh, and wow. I said, no, Australia has been talking about this NBN network for ages. And we'll have to have all the environmental conversations about digging up the green tree frogs and that sort of stuff. And Bali just didn't care. Bali they just did said, we, we need high speed internet. <laughs> they literally, they bulldozed a couple of neighborhoods um, that were in the, in the way. And they had no environmental concerns. They just put in high speed they internet. Just did so it. I, I went over for 30 days as a trial. Um, and I found the internet speeds in Bali were about three times faster than what they were in Australia for about a tenth of the price. Oh. And so then I went, because usually I go over there and I'd stay in resorts and things like that. So I went over there and went, okay, where am I going to rent a place that's close to the beach where I can watch the sun rise over the ocean? Where am I going to get my laundry done? Where am I going to buy a fridge? All this sort of logistical stuff yes, I did yes, for 30 yes. days. <laughs> and I came back to Australia, sold everything and moved to Bali. And I'm like, okay, 
this wow. is where I'm going to be working from. So, yeah, that's excellent. I love these sorts of stories because there's always a story behind the story. And, you know, what else do you like to do with yourself? Do you, I know that you've done a handful of startups, but you must be so busy. Do you have any time for yourself and do you have any hobbies that you enjoy? Well, that, that's, that's part of the fun. Like one of, my, one of my businesses way back, way back in the dark ages, yep. um, I was working 76 hours a week. And that was oh, because that I, <laughs> I thought I needed to, right? Like yeah, I thought yeah. I needed to because... <laughs> The, the way of an employee mindset is you work more hours, you make more money. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. And I sort of, because I'd been an employee and my parents were employees and school you're taught by employees. And that was kind of the mindset that I carried into my business. And working 40 hours a week, I made good income. And yep. when I started working 45 and 50 hours a week, I made more money because that's kind of logical. Um, and so then I just kept working more and more and more hours and you sort of top out yep. after a while. Yeah. Um, but you don't realize it because you're so busy all the time. And, you know, I mean, I, I worked 76 hours a week for a while. Yep. Uh, my health suffered. I mm -hmm. ended up having a stress related heart attack when I was 33 <gasps> years old. Wow. Um, my kids were still in primary school and the doctor said to me, you know, if you have another, if you don't change something, in your lifestyle, you're going to have another heart attack. And if you have another heart attack, you'll be dead. And I went, okay, what do I change? And the doctor said, look, I'm, I'm not a life coach. I'm a surgeon. It's not my job to tell you what to change, but you need to change something. Otherwise you'll be back here in 12 months in a body bag rather than on the table. Oh, geez. And so I went, okay, got to change something, got to change something. And I thought, well, I, I'm not like a, a health nut or, or a doctor or anything like that. But I, mm. I sort of figured when I cook a steak, and then you leave the pan, the fat goes solid. And part of the thing is, is having you know, fat inside of yourself. It's, it's going to block up your yeah. arteries and things like that. Yeah. Whereas if you have a salad and you leave the oil, the, the vegetable oil is liquid at room temperature. So in my genius, I just went, okay, I'm not going to eat meat anymore because it might block up my arteries. I'm just going to switch to vegetarian. Okay. And then I said, I'm going to give up coffee and I'm going to give up alcohol. I'm going to give up cigarettes because those things are apparently bad for you. So, and they're like, what else can I give up? What else can I give up? Maybe working 70 hours a week is not so good. <laughs> no. And I was, <laughs> I, was pulling in, I was pulling in six figures back then. And I thought, okay, if I sell my seven bedroom mansion, if I downsize and buy this beach shack on the Sunshine Coast, mm -hmm. I could potentially work. Because I was I've given the, the fear of God into me, you know, like I, my, oh, my kids are little yeah. in primary school. And I thought, okay, I'm going to, create a business where I can drop my kids off at school at nine in the morning and then see my first client. And I'll see another client at 11 o'clock. I'll see another client at one o'clock. I'll finish up at three o'clock in the afternoon. I'll pick up my kids and spend the rest of the day at the beach. And I don't want to work Fridays because no one likes working Fridays. <laughs> so, you know, working six hours a day, four days a week was 24 hours versus 76. And yeah, so that's wow. what I thought. I'll, I'll, I'll scale back my lifestyle, I'll sell a couple of cars, get rid of the house, buy a little beach shack and adjust myself so I can live on a third of my income um, because the money's not important after you have a, a oh, heart attack yeah. follow, followed swiftly by a six-figure divorce because I was never home for my, for my partner. Um, so I'd, I'd lost my money, I'd lost my health, and I said, okay, I'm going to focus on this stuff. So I started working 24 hours a week. I started another financial planning business. I called myself the 24-hour wealth coach. And yep. people thought I worked 24 hours a day, but it was only just 24 hours a week. <laughs> a week. But, but the interesting thing is, Richard, like I got to like the you know, first six months, I'm going, I'm, I'm finding a lot of really good clients, clients that I couldn't find previously. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was in a new town. I didn't know anybody on the Sunshine Coast. I just sort of turned up there. And um, then I got a few more clients and a few more clients and a few more clients. And by the end of the year, I sort of looked back at my figures and went, my income's dropped by about 10%. I was Not expecting a 60% drop in income yeah. because I'd, I'd cut back my hours by 60%. And one, one of my clients who was with me in the previous business um, when I was, when I was in uh, Toowoomba, and he actually traveled three hours to come and see me and said, look, the new bloke's not looking after me. I want to be looked after by you. And I said, well, look, this is the hours I work. I don't travel. I don't do anything. I don't do any after hours appointments. Yeah. And he said, well, I'm bloody glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> because on. you were always so stressed when I saw you. I said, mate, why didn't you say anything before I had a heart attack? He said, not my place to say, but he said, I used to watch you writing down things on your notepad and you had white knuckles oh. and that was not a good sign. I went, wow, 
Okay. So tell me something, Jeremy. How do you feel today? I mean, you've changed your lifestyle, and you know, you've you've geared yourself in a way that suits you. And now, I think mm. this is a very, very important insight that we've already taken away from this call because there's going to be a lot of startups, uh, entrepreneurs listening to this, thinking they have to burn the candle at both ends, so to speak. And we know that that's clearly not true. You know, also that you know you can't take these so-called things you own with you. We're we're only ever borrowing things, aren't we? And mm. and and first and the last part of all this i'd just love to know with all that being said do you still get up early what's a what's your daily routine look like do you have a, like a a fitness thing that you do what's your thing uh my thing is meditation i discovered uh, meditation 15 years ago um and it's absolutely amazing absolutely changed my life mm -hmm. um I, I was diagnosed with adhd when i was five and by two by two different doctors yep. and my parents who had four four daughters and then one son just went, oh, no, he's not ADHD. He's just a boy. He's just different. You know, he, he just, just runs around like crazy because yeah, yeah. he's a boy where the girls are sitting in the in the corner reading a book and playing with their dolls. I was destroying half the house. Um, so I was never treated. I was never re-diagnosed. I was never medicated. Yep. Uh, but I do have this thing where I love to be busy all the time. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, harnessing that was kind of the, the secret of success, really. I mean, Richard Branson's got ADHD and he's got like 500 different businesses. Um, so harnessing that, but also being able to stop. And that's in my, in my past life before the heart attack, which I used to wake up and have a couple of cups of coffee and you know, I drink six to 10 coffees a day. And at nighttime, my brain wouldn't stop. So I would just self-medicate. Wow. I'd, I'd have half a bottle of something and, and, and fall asleep. Wow. Um, but learning meditation is really like, basically it's, it's turning off, rebooting your brain. Um, even if it's just for 10 or 15 minutes, just stopping all the thoughts mm -hmm. and winding down and also learning to breathe. Like the power in all martial arts, doesn't matter whether you do karate or judo or whatever, is also the power of the breath. And there's a specific way of breathing when you punch or when you kick or when you throw someone or even when you're defending. Yep. And by harnessing the power of the breath, you can actually tap into the subconscious mind and the subconscious power. And so you know, not, I'm not religious about it. it no, it's, no. It's just one of those things. It's like a thing that you can do. Um, I like to work out, but meditation is absolutely cannot miss it. Tell you know, me something. So do you, do you, can you just switch this on and switch this on off when you need it, the meditation? Of do you course. find it di different times a day? or? Um, yes, yeah, so sometimes. Like I'll, I've, got, I've got a little app called Insight Timer. It's free for the iPhone. I'm not sure about the Android. Mm. And there's like 3,000 different meditations on there. They're all free. And you can yep. just say, I've, I've got seven minutes in between appointments or I've got 30 minutes or I need to fall asleep and, and how do I do that? Um, so guided meditations are great. I, I went and did the Vipassana course, which is a 10-day re silent retreat. So it's, you hear me talking now, I, I talk fast, I talk a lot. So <laughs> going to a retreat where you could not speak for 10 days was just a mind-blowing experience. But your brain slows down and you learn that rushing around like a bull at a gate all the time is not necessarily the best way to run run a business or or yourself yeah um, absolutely. as i say like you know heart attack followed by a six-figure divorce and then reassess your life no. i was running r running around with both arms like you know like catching butterflies trying to get a new client trying to get new yeah. business all the time and then when i sat back because i took three months off post-surgery yep and started to think about what would i like my business to be like what would i like my life to be like mm -hmm. and i thought if i just focus on myself and you know mental health and physical health and just working less spending more time with my kids spending more time at the beach unconsciously i was building a garden and if instead of chasing the butterflies all day if you sit back and you spend some time building a beautiful garden the butterflies just come to you uh, and that's what i found when i created the the additional business and get got rid of the old one is that <laughs> I, w I would meet new clients and better clients by sitting down at the coffee shop at the beach and just relaxing there and you know checking my email at the beach in a coffee shop rather yep. than being in the office and doing cold calls or, or sending out marketing campaigns because invariably there'd be someone sitting across from me at the table and in the coffee shop at the beach and the guy who's sitting across the table at nine or ten in the morning is a guy who doesn't need to be in the office no. You know, so he's usually a business owner. He's usually got a lot more money or he's a tourist or he's semi-retired or something like that. So yeah. rather than rushing around trying to find these guys, I just sat back and, hey. 
There they are. I'd go to the gym at 11 o'clock in the morning and the only people in the gym at 11 o'clock are either unemployed, who probably can't afford the gym fees, yeah. or the guys, the guys who own a business that they don't need to be there. Yeah. The real entrepreneurs who have delegated all the tasks out and they're at the gym in the middle of the day. They, you, they say you become like those you hang around. That certainly seems to be the, the fact for you. Now, I'd love to expand on that very point. Now, yeah. you, you, you've mentioned learning throughout this conversation that we're having today, Jeremy, and I'm loving the call, but tell me a little bit about um, those people that were in your life early on that helped you form you into the man that you've become today. Were there any, any prominent people that you can look to? Well, I'd have, I'd have to give a shout out to my folks. Um, my, my folks were both school teachers. So again, nothing wrong with it. They were employees. Um, they didn't run their own business. They didn't set their own hours. Didn't have a lot, a lot of money, particularly when mum was, you know, raising the next baby because, you know, we had one, one income and six kids for most of the time. <laughs> wow. Um, and I always thought like, I, I wanted toys. Like I'd see someone drive past in a Ferrari and go, oh my God, I want to have a Ferrari <laughs> like have that. <laughs> um, and, you know, obviously my folks didn't have those sort of toys because they were school teachers, they were employees, they were on, on like sort of, you know, a standard wage. Um, and when I left home, I started to seek out and find people who had a more exciting life. And I thought, I don't obviously don't want to be a school teacher like my folks. I want to create my own destiny. But because I've, I've had that ingrained in myself of, of, of simplifying complex terminologies and, and things like that and teaching people things. So when I started my first financial planning business, I was actually taking all the jargon away, taking all the bullshit away and just teaching people the fundamental stuff in plain English. Yeah. So I, I've got my, my parents' gift of simplifying the complex. And I do that with stocks and shares. I do that with economics. I do that with cryptocurrency making things very simple so i'm, I'm essentially I'm, I'm, I'm essentially basically doing what my folks did mm. i'm just teaching people who are a lot older <laughs> because they're yep. like 40 or 40 or 50 <laughs> year olds rather yep. than five year olds mm -hmm. um and also getting paid better for it yeah absolutely so. and this is uh, i guess uh, part of the genesis story for boston trading could you tell us a little bit about how boston trading actually came about what where did the idea for it come from yeah, well, I've always, I've always loved stocks and shares. That's that's been what I what I grew up on basically, and um, and started most of my most of my startup businesses with that. And in 2012, uh, one of my friends who is also a financial planner said, "Hey, you're smart. You know, you're all over macroeconomics. You should get into this Bitcoin thing. It's fantastic." And I'm like, "What's a Bitcoin?" And he's like, "It's kind of like an electronic." money system thing and it costs about six bucks <laughs> yep and i'm like why would i pay six bucks for something that doesn't exist like i, I just didn't get it six dollars wow <laughs> and he spent some time trying to convince me i didn't understand it i said no he put all of his money into bitcoin he wrote a book about bitcoin and how fabulous it was and i just kind of let it go didn't really get it and a few years later it was like 2014 2015 and, you know, again, I'm, I'm working remotely and I, I subcontract to got a virtual assistant in the Philippines and one in one in Indonesia and one in Africa and one in India. Yep. And sending money to these people like a bank transfer is costing me about 30 bucks. And some of these people in emerging economies didn't even have a bank account. So I'd have to send it via Western Union. Like I put in cash, they would go and pick up the cash uh, with their ID. Pretty outdated and, process. And, yeah. And Western Union was like $70, I think. And I was chatting to this friend of mine saying like, paying these people is just driving me crackers. And he said, oh, I use Bitcoin. I said, I've heard of that Bitcoin thing. And he said, yeah, yeah, it's basically money that you can email and it costs about 50 cents. I said, run that by me again. He's like, yeah, well, you know, what? <laughs> in the olden days, we used to send a photo home to your mum, and she'd open the envelope, but now you can just email photos and you can email documents. This is just money that you can email and to send someone a thousand dollars costs about 50 cents. And I went, well, that's significantly cheaper than the bank. Why didn't anyone tell me about this beforehand? <laughs> yeah. So I bought a boatload of Bitcoin and then, you know, paid these guys. They didn't worry about the fluctuations, of course, because they'd cash out the money the same day. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Bitcoin's great. And then the next month I'd buy a boatload of Bitcoin and I'd send it off to these people. And after three or four months, I thought, I'm just going to buy a bunch of Bitcoin because every time I go onto the internet and put in my credit card details to buy Bitcoin, I'm kind of a little bit concerned about security. Yep. So I bought a bunch of Bitcoin and this was what 2016, 2017, before everything went nuts. So I bought, you know, like maybe a couple of thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin 
yep, yep. paid all the staff, then the next month paid all the staff, then the next month paid all the staff, the next month paid all the staff, and went back and checked my balance and went, oh, there's a lot more I in there than before I started. <laughs> <laughs> like, how is this like the magic pudding for those of us who are old enough to remember? You just take away, take away, take away, and there's, there's still more left. The golden so, goose laid the egg, yeah. Yeah, so I, I didn't understand. Like, I just saw Bitcoin was basically email money. Yep. I didn't understand there was a finite amount of Bitcoin. And of course, when people are worried about inflation and, and that sort of stuff, things that are in scarce supply go up in value. So I went, oh, Bitcoin's actually kind of like gold. And one of my friends said, yeah, yeah, and there's this new thing coming out called Ethereum. And Ethereum, people can start projects on it and they can do all sorts of things. And I went, oh, okay, explain to me more about this. And he started telling me how, how Ethereum worked. And I'm like, okay, so Ethereum's kind of like oil or a phone connection that allows other things to run on it. And he's like, yeah. And there's these other projects that were coming up like Power Ledger and, and a few others, IOTA. <laughs> and I said, this cryptocurrency, it's kind of like a little tiny stock market. There's all these different projects that do different things. And he went, yeah. And I went, oh, I understand the stock market. And I got a, a process for you know, how to choose the best stocks and how to avoid the worst ones. So I started looking at cryptocurrency as if it was a little tiny stock market. Oh. And the thing with crypto, as most people know, it's unregulated. Like if, if shares, you know, if BHP shares go up 50% in one day, they close down the market and you mm -hmm. investigate what's going on. Yep. And if the NASDAQ share drops by 30% in one day, they stop selling and they investigate what's going on. But cryptocurrency, you can't do that because it's not regulated. So I would research some of these things and say, oh, this is a really good project. And the next day it would go up by like 300, 400%. And I go, holy cow. And over, over the month, I'd make like 14,000%. I go, holy cow, this is like the That's stock incredible. market on steroids. Yeah. And there's a lot of rubbish in there. But if you've got a, a criteria for checking and you know what you're doing, then you can actually make some um, incredible gains. So I was doing this and, and having a great old time. Mm -hmm. you know, previously, the, the best year I'd had in the stock market, I made 600% in a year. That was an absolute <laughs> best year. And that happened once, right? Um, and in cryptocurrency, I could make a thousand percent in a week, easy. That's crazy. And I was I was chatting to um, my partner and saying, "Hey, look, look what I'm doing! Look what I'm doing!" And she's like, "Oh, that's fantastic! Can you show me how to do that?" And I gave her the checklist, and she just went bang, 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 bang. She started buying a few things, making three or four hundred percent in a week. And because she's got a lower risk profile on me, because she's not necessarily got all the, the market experience. And I talked to one of my friends who's a financial planner and he said, oh, what are you up to these days? I said, I'm playing with crypto and making all these great gains. And he's like, oh, can you show me how to do that? So I taught him how to do it. And then people told people and I was like, I don't want to spend you know, all my time teaching a hundred people how to do this. So I just put no. it on the website. Yep, yep. Here's the checklist. Here's how you do it. Free information. If anybody called me, I'd say, go to the website, look at there's the information on how to do it yourself. And then I had contact from my partner who said, like, this is all fun and games, but I want to work on my business. I don't have time to do the research anymore. Can you do it for me? And, you know, she's my, she's my partner and I love her and she knows yep, where I course. live. So, yep. I went, yeah, okay. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll run your lower risk portfolio and I'll run my higher risk portfolio at the same time and make some money. And then my friend who is the financial planner, he called me back and said, look, you know, this is all fun and games, but I don't have time to do it. Will you do it for me? And I was like, whoa, hang on. Hang like, on. You're my friend. I've known you for 25 years, but you, you don't know where I live. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't want to risk a friendship because crypto can be very volatile. Yes, you can make a thousand percent one day, but you can lose 50% the next day. Highs and lows. And I, I, I said to him, look, I, I really don't want to do it because if it drops by 50% in one day, if I've made a bad decision, I'm going to risk this 25 year friendship. He said, no, no, it won't happen. It won't happen. I said, no, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want a week later. He calls me again, says, will you take my money? Will you do it for me? I went, no. <laughs> week later, he, he rings me again and says, will you do it? And I said, no, and he said, please. And I went, oh, look, the only <laughs> way I would do it is if we'd set up this kind of a legal structure, had it all policed and, you know, verified and that sort of stuff. Um, got to do a unit trust because obviously financial planning, that's where I grew up. They do unit trusts with mutual funds and that sort of stuff. I said, yep. this is the only way I would do it for you. And he said, you do whatever you got to do. I'll be happy with whatever you decide. So then I went and talked to the corporate lawyer, called the accountant, called an international tax lawyer and said, hey, I want to set up this unitized trust thing. There we go. <laughs> um, 
and make this thing all legal, all kosher, because there's no regulations, right? But we want to make it as if the regulations for mutual funds, for stock mutual funds, but for crypto. Yep. And the accountant said, you're doing a mutual fund for crypto. And I went, yeah. And the accountant goes, oh, I'll give you 10 grand for that. And I'm oh. like, oh, okay. I don't know how many accountants you know, Rich, but the last time any accountant has ever said, I'll invest into that. No. <laughs> <a little> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, so I thought, okay, we've, we've got our first customer, our first real customer. Yep. Um, so then I went back and, you know, between myself and my partner and the financial planner and the corporate lawyer and the accountant, we all chipped in like, you know, 10 grand each and started mm -hmm. up this little mm -hmm. thing. And we were, okay, it's all legal, it's all kosher, it's all, you know, compliant to all this regulation that doesn't even exist yet, but as if we're setting up a stock mutual fund. And then someone said, oh, we've got to have a logo and we've got to have a name for this thing. And I'm like, oh, you got any yeah, ideas? Okay. You're looking around the table. Well, you've got accountants, <laughs> corporate lawyers and financial planners. None of us are creative. None of us are in marketing. <laughs> we're all geeks. Like we're all, we're all nerdy number geeks, right? Numbers and technology. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and we couldn't think of any ideas. We're sitting there trying to, you know, we, we ironed out all the kinks of that, yep. but then couldn't think of a name or a logo. And just then the dog walked into the room, a little Boston Terrier, and went, uh, oh my God, there's there the logo and there's the name. That was the best <laughs> oh, thing we could it. think of. <laughs> so and it stuck. We it up and it stuck. We said, we'll, we'll run this thing for 12 months. If it does well, we'll launch it to the public. If it doesn't do well, we'll just put it back into the box and we won't tell anyone about it. Yep, um, yep. And obviously, we did well over the over the first twelve months. We launched it to the public, and Fantastic. every year for the last six and a half years, we've outperformed Bitcoin. So That's incredible. Absolutely pleased with that. Yeah. So tell me something. You've talked about accountants, but you've also talked about busy people. Um, who is who is mm. this best for? Do you do you work with um, people other than the financial sector? Who's who's your target client? Do you think? Well, really, if if you look at it in in the US, the stats are that 90% of investors use a mutual fund or an index fund because yep. they're simply too busy looking after their kids, looking after their business, doing their do, you know, playing yep, their sports, yep. whatever. 90% mm -hmm. of people don't have time to research their own stocks. In Australia, the figures are a little bit more rebellious because Australians are a bit more rebellious. <laughs> yeah. uh, but in, in Australia, it's 85% of investors who use a mutual fund or an index fund because they don't have time to research their own stocks. So it's mm. basically anybody, any, anybody who wants to invest in the stock market but doesn't want to be bothered doing all the research, they give their money to a fund manager. And that's what we're looking at here. People who want to get the great returns in cryptocurrency but don't want to do the research. And we, we've done, even after the big June crash where, where Bitcoin crashed down by 50, 60%, even after that crash, the last three years, the fund has made 291%. Oh, that's incredible. So, almost you know almost 300 percent in three years and our investors like they don't know how we did it we send mm -hmm. out a newsletter every month saying this is what we did and this is why we did it but they don't have to actually take the time to read the newsletter they don't have they to don't worry have to about do it the work that's a very so. big thing that's a very powerful thing for busy people who are on the call today if you're listening into this this is certainly something you might want to look into now i'd love for you to um tell the audience about your four-step proprietary coin process what's that about all right okay. um so in <laughs> in my first in my first book um i had a nine-step criteria for choosing your own stocks for people who actually wanted to do that people who didn't want to go and pay a financial planner and obviously in the crypto world it is simplified because you don't have to jump through all the hoops to list yourself on the stock exchange so literally two guys in the garage started power ledger um, and they didn't have enough money to list on the stock exchange, so they made a cryptocurrency. And one of their first investors, funnily enough, was Richard Branson, who's fully into solar power with his Necker Island. Mm -hmm. um, so with, with the, the nine-step criteria, some of those things don't apply because the average cryptocurrency project doesn't report on its earnings and they don't have a board of directors and things like that. Yep. So we simplified it right down to four steps easy to remember so coin c-o-i-n and the number one thing that you check out is the c-suite ceo cfo cmo the guys who are actually running the project and on the website they might just be anonymous they might not even have photos and you go well mm -hmm. if they're anonymous where are they going to be how am i going to track them down if i want my money back you know there's a lot of rug pulls and and yes. scams and things that people have disappeared with their money in crypto 
And so you want to check out the, the directors and the leaders of this thing, the C-suite, and don't just have a look at them on, and say, oh, they're there on the page, because it might be a Google stock image, or it might be a, 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 a real person's name, but if you go and highlight that guy's name and search him on LinkedIn, he doesn't actually work for the project. So check them out. It, it literally takes about 60 seconds to scroll yep. through, see if the team's there, see if the team yep. are actually real people. Google mm -hmm. them, check them on LinkedIn, go, yep, that lines up. So first tick there if they've actually got a real team with real experience working on the project. Yep. Then O stands for the offering. What are they actually doing? Okay. Now, there was someone out there a while ago who was like, oh, we're going to put avocados on the blockchain and revolutionize the <laughs> fruit industry. Like, well, how does that work? How does that help me? Whereas, as I mentioned before, the guys with Power Ledger, they were empty nesters. Like, their kids had moved out of the house and they're like, oh, there's only me and the missus at home and we've got these massive solar panels on the roof generating so much more power than what we need now. The kids are gone. But if I sell that power back to the grid, I only get 10 cents a kilowatt. But when I turn on the TV, I'm paying 30 cents a kilowatt. Wouldn't it be great if I could sell that power to my neighbor and make the neighbor pay 15 cents? That way I'm getting paid extra than what I get uh, paid for giving to the grid. Yes, and the neighbor is paying less than what he would giving to the grid. And so the guys, you know, like we're all connected on the on big infrastructure with electricity. We're all connected to the internet. So they figured out a way you could actually sell your excess solar credits to the neighbors, like an eBay for, for power. And that's a great offering. It actually helps the, the, the person who's generating power. It helps the person who's consuming I love power. It. Yeah. Fantastic offering. There's some offerings out there that are legitimately like, who's going to pay for this? Like, why would I do that? So it's got to be something that solves a real world It's got to have you utility, know, does it doesn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Mm. So that C and O, I is for the investors. Mm -hmm. So who, who are other investors into this project? Because no one wants to be first and no one wants to be last. Um, as I said with, with Power Ledger, one of their first investors was Richard Branson, because he generates a lot of solar power on Necker Island. And rather than selling it to the grid, he wanted to sell it to other people when he found out about their offering. So I don't have as much money as Richard Branson. I don't have as many people working for me as Richard Branson. But if he jumps into a project and he's one of the early investors, I think he's smarter than me. He's richer than me. He's probably paid 40 analysts to check this project You've out. You've got to look at it, don't you? So I've already got a tick from the CEO suite. I've got a tick <laughs> from the offering. And then I go, the investor, he's no dummy. So no I'll give dummy. you a good tick yep. from there. Yep. Um, if the other investors are just people who also got roped into, you know, Squid Game coin or I Love Boobs coin <laughs> or F. Joe Biden coin, yeah, those sorts of, I don't want to be involved with those nah, people. Right? Pass. And then the final one, the N, is the network. Because the great thing is you can, you know, you can drop a hundred bucks into a coin project and it might hit up to, you know, $10,000. But then who do you sell it to? Yeah. Right? There's got to be a network of people who are willing to buy this thing from you. Otherwise you've just, you know, you bought one of these NFTs um, and nobody wants to buy it from you. And you've got your money, and you're like, potentially I've got $10,000, but I can't sell it to anybody. But unlikely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so you check the network, you, you, you check all the, all the normal social medias, the Twitters, the Facebooks, the YouTubes, who's talking about this project? Who's interested in this project? Who's yep. gonna support me with my questions? Who's gonna be the one to buy it from me when I want to sell? So it's very simple, C-O-I-N, yep. C-suite, offering, investors, and network. I Basic, and again, takes takes you five minutes, literally five minutes to check through a project and find out if it's legit. If it gets one one red cross, then don't do it. Don't it's do it. If it's got four green ticks, then go for it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Otherwise, that. you pay someone else to do it for you. Yeah, and you, you're happy to burn your money, that's for sure and certain, if you don't follow that coin process mm. now. I'm wondering, um, you know, I, I know that you've got a lot going on on your, your website, but if somebody wants to, uh, I guess, connect with you and work with you, what is the, uh, the location that they're going to find you and what's the onboarding process? Uh, well, the, the main site is bostontrading.co. Mm -hmm. um, so just bostontrading.co, not, not .com. Not .com. Um, that's, yep. where we have the, yeah, that's where we have the managed fund. That's where we have the, the newsletters and things like that. So you can literally go back and see the last six years of newsletters. So you can see what, what were we buying before the pandemic occurred? What were we looking at? What were we doing when this happened? Um, and you can see the results, what we're buying, what we're selling and how we do things. So the newsletter usually starts off with a top down sort of, 
here's what's happening in the global macroeconomic environment. Here's how that affects stocks and shares. Here's how that affects cryptocurrency. And it's an, it's an educational piece. Like you read five newsletters, you'll be smarter than most economists easily. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is obviously where we do it for you. Yep. If you, you don't want to do it yourself. Uh, but for people who want to learn how to do it themselves, for that 10 or 15% of people, they go to Krillionaire.com. So it's literally C-R-Y for crypto. And then the last bit of billionaire. So yep. Krillionaire.com. And smart. that's where we've got a, <laughs> a, bunch of, a bunch of videos and blog posts and all the coins that we actually do research on. Um, so you can actually look in there and say, here's why we think this is a good project. Here's how to download a wallet. Here's how to protect yourself. Here's how to do this. So all the people who want to learn how to do it yourself, if you've got time to do it, absolutely do it yourself. Uh, if you don't have time to do it, then we just run like a mutual fund at Boston. Um, so we charge 2% a year. It's pretty cheap and easy uh, if you don't have the time. Yeah, and making that uh, a simplified process for busy people is where I think uh, that Boston trading is going to stick out above all else. And, you know, the way that the cryptocurrency space is uh, ever evolving, it's certainly going to be uh, up there with the leaders in this uh, particular space. And with all that being said, Jeremy, I've absolutely loved this call, love spending some time with you on the My Future Business Show today. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.